What you are seeing may look like just a small stand of trees in the middle of a field. Hundreds of people probably drive past it every day and have never even noticed it. But what happened on that spot could have quite literally triggered the apocalypse. The night of January 24, 1961 would go down as one of the most terrifying aviation events in American history. In fact, this is what the morning of January 24th could have very well looked like. This is the test of the exact type of thermonuclear weapon that we are about to discuss. Each one was 200 times as powerful as the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. But it didn't start off that way. In fact, to First Lieutenant Adam Maddox, who was just 27 at the time, it was every bit of a routine mission that they had flown dozens of times before. The bomber is part of about a dozen B-52s that stay airborne 24-7 on high alert to defend the country against the Soviet Union. The B-52 was based at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base near Goldsboro, North Carolina. At midnight on January 24, 1961, the B-52 was scheduled to rendezvous with the tanker for a standard mid-air refueling. During the refueling, the tanker crew told the B-52 commander, Major Walter Scott Tullock, that his plane had a fuel leak coming from the right wing. The refueling was aborted and the ground control was notified of the issue. The bomber was told to fly off the coast and circle until most of the fuel in the plane had been consumed so it would make an, so it could make an emergency landing a little bit safer. But when the bomber had reached its assigned position, Major Tullock informed control that the leak had worsened and he had lost 37,000 pounds of fuel in only three minutes. Control ordered the aircraft to immediately return and land at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. As the bomber descended through 10,000 feet on its approach to the Air Force Base, the pilots were no longer able to maintain control of the plane and at the time, Major Tolick ordered the crew to abandon the aircraft, which they did at about 9,000 feet. Lieutenant Maddox unbuckled his seatbelt and the G-forces threw him 10 feet across the plane and pinned him against the floor. He said a prayer, Lord, if I go, take me to heaven. And at that time, the co-pilot opens his hatch and jumps out of the plane. Then Major Tullock follows. Lieutenant Maddox pulls himself off the floor and successfully crawls out of the hatch. He flies out into the violent chaos of freefall and manages to open his parachute. Lieutenant Adam Maddox is the only person known to have successfully bailed out the top hatch of a B-52 without an ejection seat. The last glimpse of the plane was of it intact with its payload of two Mark 39 thermonuclear bombs still tucked safely away in its belly, but that was about to change. The bombs would be thrown loose in the plane as the plane disintegrated between 1,000 and 2,000 feet above the ground. Local newspapers that interviewed eyewitnesses say the explosion looked like daylight, it was so bright, while others said that the aircraft ripping to pieces looked like a Roman candle. Earl Lancaster, the assistant fire chief for the Faro Volunteer Fire Department, rushes to the scene in his fire truck. Within an hour, helicopters swarm the area. Air Force officials urge everyone to evacuate. They told us to get, and we got, Lancaster told the reporter in his interview. Three crew members perished in the crash. The body of Major Eugene Shelton was found hanging from a tree by his parachute, deceased. The other two crew members of the plane that perished were found in the nose of the aircraft. Major Walter Tullock was believed to be dead as well, but he appears just before dawn as he walks out of the swamp. Lieutenant Adam Maddox landed beside a farmhouse. He tells the family who he is, and they drive him to the Air Force Base. But all of his pockets have been torn off during the ejection from the aircraft, and he has no ID. The guards think he's just someone trying to get into the base illegally, so he is detained at the gate. But 20 minutes later... Major Tullock arrives at the gate, but he also doesn't have any ID. But after the confusion, the guards call an ambulance and the situation is sorted out. Back at the wreck site, aircraft debris is scattered over two square miles of tobacco and cotton fields, about 12 miles north of downtown Goldsboro, North Carolina. The two bombs were both located when the recovery team arrived on site. One of the bombs had went into free fall after the plane broke up and plunged into a muddy farm field about 700 miles per hour without its conventional explosives detonating. 
The tail of the bomb was finally discovered 20 feet underground after extensive excavation. What they found when they inspected the bomb sent a chill up the spine of the 25-year-old Lieutenant Jack Revel, the officer in charge of the EOD team recovering the weapons. His sergeant had found the external arming switch that was the final failsafe against accidental detonation of the weapon, and the switch had been armed. Until my death, I will never forget hearing my sergeant say, Lieutenant, we found the arm safe switch. And I said, great. And he replied back, not great, it's on arm. The only thing that prevented the weapon from detonating was an unclosed high voltage switch inside the bomb that had actually failed. On the fifth day of the dig, what they were after was found. Revel, not wearing any protective gear except a pair of gloves, climbed down into the hole and fell into a puddle of muddy water and ran his hand across something round. It was about the size of a volleyball. The pit had been located. It was pretty heavy as I carried it up out of that hole. I remember thinking, don't drop it, Revel said. Finally, excavation of the weapon was abandoned due to uncontrollable groundwater flooding. Most of the thermonuclear stage of the weapon containing uranium and plutonium was left in place. But the critical piece of the weapon, the plutonium pit, had been located and taken along with all 92 explosive detonators, and the bomb was now useless as a weapon. The United States Corps of Engineers purchased a 400-foot diameter plot of land around the impact site where the bomb still remains and the University of North Carolina maintains regular groundwater monitoring of the site. The other bomb's parachute had deployed after it fell from the doomed aircraft and it gently floated back down to earth and was found suspended from a tree. Lieutenant Jack Rebel again was disturbed when he found that the bomb's ignition sequences had all activated. The only thing that prevented an explosion of the weapon was the manual arming switch, which had been armed on the buried bomb, was on safe when it fell. The Pentagon claimed at the time that it was, there was no chance of an explosion and that two arming mechanisms had not activated. A United States Department of Defense spokesperson even went on record and said that two arming mechanisms had not activated. A blatant lie. Finally, in 2013, a Freedom of Information request confirmed that a single solitary safety switch that had accidentally been armed on the other bomb that had fallen was the only thing that prevented the 3.8 megaton thermonuclear bomb from accidentally wiping out eastern North Carolina and irradiating the east coast of the United States. Not only that, considering the level of tension between the United States and the Soviet Union at the time of this accident, if this event had actually resulted in a nuclear explosion, it could have easily been misconstrued as a first strike from the Soviet Union and triggered an all-out nuclear war. In a now declassified report called The Goldsboro Revisited, written by Parker Jones, a supervisor of nuclear safety at Sandia National Laboratories, Jones said that one simple dynamo technology low voltage switch stood between the United States and a major catastrophe and concluded that the Mark 39 Mod 2 bomb did not possess adequate safety for airborne alert roll in the B-52.